Y'all may have a seat. Good morning. I welcome you to Olive Branch Baptist Church today. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so glad that you were here with us today as we continue to worship the Lord in this cold weather and in the midst of this pandemic. But I did want to tell you a couple of things that are happening as things change every week because our school district keeps changing things every week. So uh, for our children's ministry, it will not begin this Wednesday night. It will begin the next Wednesday night as we wait for in-person school to start again. And uh, our youth ministry continues uh, regardless what the school's doing. So that continues. But uh, instead of the father-daughter dance that uh, we were going to have in February, it's going to be a family movie night. So uh, if you, uh, uh, Brady, I'm sure anyone could come, right? Bring, uh, bring your family and come and enjoy the movie. Uh, but our youth are going to do that instead of uh, the father-daughter dance uh, because I guess it'll be spread out more, safer. I don't know. Everything nowadays is just weird, isn't it? So that, that's, and Lunch Buddies hopefully will be starting again on the 10th, again, because of the school, everything is getting moved around. So those things are in your bulletin. But also this is the time of the year when we're sending you statements about what you have uh, given to the church during the past year. So I did want to say thank you for giving. Uh, I probably do not say that enough. Uh, thank you for the generosity. Thank you for your uh, giving. Uh, I know that when you give, you give to the Lord, and you are giving because of what He has called you to do, and you are being obedient. So I know you're not really giving uh, to a, a building or a church or a pastor or a ministry. It is giving to the Lord. And so I uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, if you would have gotten an email this week uh, with your statement. If you did not get that or you can't print it out or you were, they were also mailed out, so, but hey, they were mailed out. You may get them in three weeks. Who knows how the mail's been going. So, so if you don't get it within three weeks or you can't get it, whatever, you need it, you just call the church office or email Sandra. That email address is in the bulletin, and you will get your statement. Uh, I think we got, we're still getting Christmas cards. Uh, uh, and Johnny's birthday was... The 15th, he's still getting birthday cards. So who knows? I mean, that, that's kind of nice, isn't it? It spreads it out over a few weeks, over a month. And so your birthday cards come over three months, period. That's fine. So anyway, uh, glad that you're here this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we're going to continue to worship him as we sing. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for our time together this morning. I thank you, Lord, that you have made us. and I thank you, Lord, that you have saved us. And I thank you, Lord, that we have this opportunity and this privilege to be together, together to worship you, the almighty God, the eternal God. And I'm thankful, Lord, that we are here. I pray that as we continue to be together, as we continue to worship you this morning and hear your word, I pray, Lord, that you would draw us closer to you. And I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified and lifted up. I thank you again, Lord, and pray for your blessing upon our time. And I pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. And I also forgot to say, thank you, Fina, for playing. That's one of my favorite hymns, Be Thou My Vision. And it was wonderful. Fina was going to play when we were going to have our Christmas uh, music in December. Of course, our schedule got changed. And so that made it uh, difficult for Fina to be here in December. So she was here this morning. So thank you, Fina, for uh, playing that. And so... Mary, let's continue to worship the Lord. One of my neighbors called me this week, and he had received a good report. It was um, uh, it was a medical report, and and it was about uh, the cancer, and it was about the chemotherapy drugs drugs that were working on the cancer, and the cancer was disappearing. And he said, "You know, God might not always work the way that we want Him to. He might not always work in the timing that we want Him to. But God is always on time." So that was a reminder for that. And um, I had to uh, go to the hospital to have a COVID test on Wednesday in preparation for another test on Thursday. And I got to meet this um, nice gentleman that day. And it just goes to show that God has a providence and he has a plan. And in, he said, you know, the older I get, the less patience that I have. And I said, it's probably because you don't feel well. He said, I don't feel well. He said, everything hurts. And we got to talking about the news and how discouraging the news was. I said, I don't watch it anymore hardly. I used to watch it a lot. Now I don't. He said, when I watch it, I get depressed. And I said, yeah. I said, you know, sometimes it looks like God um, is not working. I said, but God is in control. 
And I said, he has a plan for us as believers. He has a plan for us to have eternal life. And this is not all that we have. And he said, you know, I've never been a very religious person. He said, but the Bible does talk about prophecy. And he said, I do believe that prophecy um, is what we're living out today. And so um, anyway, we got to talk and I would not have met him had it been a year ago when the doctor ordered the test <laughs> prior to COVID, I would not have been in the room with him had the nurse not made the mistake and forgot to put the order in. I would have gone through the drive through COVID instead of gone to the hospital to have it done. And she was all apologetic. But you know what? In the end, I was like, you know, God had a plan and a purpose for me to meet that gentleman that day and for us to talk about the hope that we have in God and that God is in control each and every day. So I thank him for that. Um, it's just a part of his providence. So we need to look for that each and every day and where we go, where we come into play in that. And so the scripture today um, comes from 1 Peter. And it's, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and with respect. But we have hope as Christians. We don't have to be discouraged. We can be temporarily discouraged, but we know that God has a plan and he's in control and in the end he is going to win. So we're just um, happy about that. So please join us this morning. We're going to sing hymn 724 and we'll transition to hymn 624. Please join us. Oh, <laughs> 
good morning, everyone. I have not done a kid's sermon in a while, so we're going to get the, the rust off today. Um, there's something ironic that we, uh, the last song that we sang was Eye on the Sparrow. Benji and I are starting up our new tradition of every Saturday is uh, a Benji and Dad Day. We normally start the morning off after breakfast with uh, watching Veggie Tales because that's how my parents raised me, and <laughs> I'm thankful for it. And uh, that song was in the one we watched yesterday, and it talked about the life of a guy that, kids, you probably don't know who he is, but his name was George Mueller. So I guess uh, moms, dads, grandparents, how many of you have heard the name George Mueller before? George Mueller. All right, so what's cool about George Mueller is that he is known for, uh, back in the like 1800s, of uh, being in charge of all of these orphanages in England. But what's cool about him is that he never asked anybody for money. He never asked anybody for help. He relied solely on the Lord uh, in prayer to provide the needs for not only him, but also for all of these hundreds and eventually thousands of kids that would come in through his orphanages. And so he is pretty much just this testimony to, here's this normal guy who uh, just relied so strongly on prayer. And so I was originally going to talk about prayer this morning for the kids' sermon, so it's it's fun to see how all these little things just kind of come together to, uh, you know, meet here in the middle. So there's this part in the book of Acts where Peter and John are, uh, they're, they're preaching the gospel, they, they heal somebody, and they get arrested, and they, uh, eventually the, the leaders, they, they let them go, but they say, hey, whatever you do, you better not be talking about Jesus anymore. And so they, uh, they, they go back, and it says specifically, because I want to note this here, in Acts chapter 4, maybe if I was on the right page, it says that when they release, or when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And so at the very end of this, in verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, Notice it doesn't say in those verses that Peter and John, that they went back to just the other apostles, but it says they went to friends. And so it seems like after Peter and John got out, they just went to other normal believers, people that already believed in Jesus. And it was after they prayed that the Lord did something incredible and gave them the boldness and power to go out and keep telling people about the gospel. And so here's the the big thing is that you don't have to be someone incredible for God to use you and your prayers. You don't have to, you know, be raising the dead in order to have an impactful prayer life. Now, maybe, who knows, if you pray for someone to be raised from the dead and it happens, all right, tell us how you did that there, but that's pretty impressive. Um, but the big thing is, like, even if you look at the life of George Mueller, he, he would be the first to tell you he was just an ordinary guy who believed that the Lord still answered prayer, and his life is a testimony to how the Lord had continuously, you know, time and time again answered his prayer. So guys, keep praying, keep searching after the Lord, and he will answer you, and he will surprise you in in just incredible ways. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to continue with special music. So let's, let's pray. Dear Lord, I just pray for the same thing that the believers in Acts chapter 4 prayed, that that we would be filled with strength and boldness to declare your word and your gospel uh, to the world around us. We know that the world can be, seem scary, that sometimes we might feel a little bit tongue-tied when it comes to telling others about you, but Lord, we know that you are a powerful and awesome God, and that if, if you can use someone like Moses who claims that he just can't speak, then there's hope for us yet too. So we love you and we praise you, and we look forward to worshiping you this day. And it's in Jesus' name, amen.
for my appointment. Go ahead and sign in. How long? That is the question we have been asking for months in this pandemic. It's the question you ask every time you go to the doctor and other places where you have to wait in line. And it's the question that Habakkuk or Habakkuk asked in the book that bears his name of God. How long? We looked at it last week and we're going to look at it again and learn some more from him this morning. Uh, before we look at the book this morning, I wanted to introduce you to the platypus. If you had never heard of the platypus before, this unusual animal that lives in Australia, uh, as the slide says here, it's an egg-laying, duck-billed, beaver-tailed, otter-footed mammal that's also venomous. Now think about that for a moment. In fact, the first Europeans to see in 1799 a preserved, I guess it was like a stuffed a platypus you know, that came from Australia, they thought it was a fake. They thought someone had sewed all these animal pieces together to create this thing just to fool them or trick them. Yet this is an animal that God has created. And so it means that God has a sense of humor and wanted just to make something for fun. I, I, it's hard to imagine if that, you know, the case God said, I made all this, let's just, ha let's just have some fun. You know, let's just put something together just to really throw everybody off. Or maybe it is a humorous example of how things don't always make sense. That God doesn't always make sense when he makes decisions, when he makes animals, when he rules the world. And that is certainly true when it comes to Habakkuk. It does not make sense what has happened, what is happening. If you remember from last week, Habakkuk asked two questions of God. God, how long am I going to have to keep praying and you are going to be silent and not listen? And he also asked, why don't you do something? Why aren't you doing anything? You see the violence, you see the oppression, you see a nation that is in terrible, terrible shape and you're doing nothing. How long, God, before you answer? How long before you act? That's what Habakkuk asked, and God gave him an answer. It was the answer that no one would have expected. God said, I'm going to do something. I'm going to destroy your nation by bringing another nation to destroy you. As we said last week, it would be as though we see our nation in turmoil and we pray out to God. We would want God to say, I'm going to bring a revival. Or we would want God to say, I'm going to punish the wicked and exalt the righteous. That's what Habakkuk was hoping for. But he got this answer instead. It would be like if we prayed, God save our nation, and God said, I'm going to destroy your nation. Well, that's not what I was praying for, God. That's not what I was expecting. But that was the answer that Habakkuk got. And if you remember last week, we said in those times we need to keep praying when it seems as though God is silent. We need to seek God. Seeking God is where things become clearer because God does not always give us an explanation. But God will always be closer to those who seek him. And the closer we are to God, the clearer things in our life make sense. And we must trust him. And these truths are even highlighted more as God and Habakkuk continue to have their conversation. Habakkuk asked God, Well, God, since you are holy, how can you choose someone more wicked to punish the wicked? 
It's almost like two wrongs don't make things right. There is a wicked nation, Judah, and God is going to punish them by bringing a more wicked nation, Babylon. And uh, Habakkuk's point is, God, you're holy. Is that what a holy God does? Does a, does a holy God allow wickedness to destroy more wickedness? That makes no sense whatsoever. Here are the verses where Habakkuk asks that question. Are you not from eternity, Lord my God, my holy one? You will not die. Lord, you appointed them, the Babylonians, to execute judgment, my rock. You destined them to punish us. Your eyes are too pure to look on evil, and you cannot tolerate wrongdoing. You see his point? God, you're holy. You can't look on wrongdoing. You cannot allow evil. Yet you're allowing an evil nation to destroy your people. It doesn't make sense, God. Explain it to me, he is asking. God, explain to me how this makes sense. Habakkuk continues with another question to God. So why do you tolerate those who are treacherous? Why are you silent while one is wicked swallows up one who is more righteous than himself? And he goes on, since Judah would be as helpless as a school of fish, doesn't God have compassion on his people? Here are the verses. Habakkuk says, You have made mankind like the fish of the sea, like marine creatures that have no ruler. The Chaldeans, again the Babylonians, pull them all up with a hook, catch them in their dragnet, and gather them in their fishing net. That is why they are glad and rejoice. In other words, the picture is this. The nation of Judah, the nations that the Babylonians are destroying, are like fish swimming in the ocean. They're helpless when it comes to a net. They are helpless when it comes to a fisherman coming with his net and pulling them up and dragging them out of the water and taking them away. And Habakkuk says, God, Judah is your chosen people. Don't you care about them? Don't you have compassion on us? We're helpless. We can't fight back. If you are truly a God who loves his chosen people, why don't you have compassion for us? It doesn't make sense, God. A compassionate, loving God would not allow his people to be helpless and be destroyed by a wicked nation. It doesn't make any sense. His third question is this. God, how can you allow a nation who doesn't even worship you? They're idolaters. They worship false gods. How can you allow them to punish your holy chosen people who do worship you? God, it doesn't make sense. He says, that is why they sacrifice to their dragnet and burn incense to their fishing net. For by these things, their portion is rich and their food plentiful. Will they therefore empty their net and continually slaughter nations without mercy? So again, what is happening is Habakkuk heard from God, I'm going to destroy your nation with the Babylonians. And Habakkuk comes back to God and says, God, it doesn't make sense. You are holy. How can two wrongs make a right? We are your chosen people. Don't you have compassion on us? How can you allow a nation that doesn't even acknowledge you be the one who conquers us who worship you? Habakkuk is ready for an answer from God. In fact, the next verses say this. Habakkuk says, I will stand on my guard post and station myself on the rampart. And I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. He's waiting, he's standing, he's watching for an answer. It doesn't make sense, God. Explain it to me. Before we get God's answer, I want to hit the pause button. I want us to imagine ourselves maybe as the people of Israel in this time. Imagine ourselves as Habakkuk. You see, Habakkuk sees himself and his nation as a whole as 
godly people, the chosen people, righteous people. And he's saying, how dare you, God, allow them, the unbelievers, the pagan, the wicked, to judge us? He has in his mind this separation between us and them. Now, we are the righteous. They are the unrighteous. We're better than they are. They can't judge us. They can't punish us. And it's sort of the same idea that the Pharisees had. They saw themselves as the righteous. Those who weren't Pharisees as the unrighteous. How dare anyone who's unrighteous judge them or compare to them? And sometimes we as Christians can have this mindset as well, which can be the wrong mindset to have. Problems come to, into our life and we look at others and think they should have worse problems than us because we're more righteous than they are. We look at our life and we see turmoil and we question God and we do not realize that maybe there is a reason why God is punishing us. Because we aren't as righteous as we think we are. You see, in Habakkuk's day, this was the end of hundreds of years of God's patience. God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet. God had sent plagues, and he had sent famine, and he had sent... Uh, Locusts, I mean, you, he had sent natural disasters. He had sent prophets. He had sent warnings. He said, repent, come back, repent, come back. And every time the people heard it, they ignored it. Well, Habakkuk's complaining. They've had plenty of opportunity. See, he, he forgot about that. He's complaining about what's about to happen. He's forgotten that the people have had multiple chances over multiple generations, over hundreds of years. I think God's been pretty patient with them and kind of fair with them. So I ask you these questions. When we have problems in our life, God does bring problems to bring discipline. And maybe we're too quick to blame God or think other people should suffer more than us because we're righteous and maybe there is something wrong in our life that needs to be fixed. Sin to repent of. Maybe we need to be closer to God. And God has allowed it in our lives for that reason. I think that's always the first question we should ask when we feel as though we're having trouble in our life that's unfair. The first question should be, is there something in my life that I need to get right? Is God getting my attention because there's sin or there's a problem? Now, your answer to that question may be no. Maybe the answer is no. There is no sin that you need to repent of. There is nothing in your life that's wrong that you need to correct to be right with God. Well, if that's true and that's not the reason, then God has a different reason for this problem in your life. But too many times we just skip over that. Like I think Habakkuk is almost doing. He's just focusing on the fact that these Babylonians are wicked people and how dare they be the ones who judge us. And God is saying, I've been patient with you. You've had your chances. My patience run out. The hammer's coming down now. And also this, uh, sometimes like the Pharisees, like Habakkuk here, we forget that you know, unbelievers don't have the relationship with God that we do. You see, Habakkuk's complaining about how wicked the Babylonians are. They're idolaters and they're evil and they're wicked and they have no compassion and they're horrible people. And you could almost say, well, they're, they're unbelievers. What do you expect? That's what unbelievers are like. They don't have a relationship with God. The Babylonians didn't know any better. Who should have known better was Habakkuk and the Jews. They did know God. They did have the Bible. They did have the law of God. They should have known better. You see, again, he's complaining about a wicked people and he's ignoring the wickedness in the nation. And realizing that those outside, you can kind of expect them to be that way. They don't have a relationship with God. 
those in the family of God, their life should look completely different. So sometimes we do that as well, I think. We look at others and we see their lifestyle and we see their sin. And, and again, when our life is in turmoil, we look at their life and say, well, look how sinful they are. Why are they prospering? Why isn't God doing something to them when he's not? And then we forget maybe our lives aren't as righteous as we think they are. I love this quote from Warren Wearsby. He says, when God's people deliberately disobey him, they sin against a flood of light and an ocean of love. Sin anywhere is an awful affront to God, but sin, especially in a Christian's life, is more of an affront to God because we should know better. So that's the pause I wanted to put in this. It's easy, like Habakkuk did, to start pointing fingers and start blaming God and looking at other nations and saying, wow, they're wicked. I think he should have spent some more time looking inward. God had been patient. God had brought prophets. He had tried to turn the people back, but they wouldn't listen. And those people in Habakkuk's day were not the holy, righteous people that they should have been. In fact, they were probably just as wicked as those Babylonians were at that time. But God does answer Habakkuk. Let's go back to that. He answers him. He basically says to Habakkuk, don't worry, Habakkuk, I'm going to destroy the Babylonians too. Okay, so that's his answer. So Habakkuk is going on and on complaining about how wicked they are and about how they deserve punishment. And God says, well, they're going to get it. That's what's going to happen. Then God basically lays out for Habakkuk, this, these truths, when God does not make sense, when God doesn't make sense, there are two paths that you can go down. One is to trust in yourself. The other is to trust in God. Back in chapter 2, verse 4 says this, Look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity, but the righteous one will live by his faith. Moreover, wine betrays. An arrogant man is never at rest. He enlarges his appetite like shale, and like death he is never satisfied. He gathers all the nations to himself. He collects all the peoples for himself. Uh, these words are describing the Babylonians specifically, a nation that was arrogant, a nation that had no concern for God, a, a nation that was a drunk on power and conquering nation after nation, thinking that if they had one more country, they had more territory, they would be satisfied, but they never were. But they're an illustration of how Anyone who trusts in themselves is arrogant and always thirsting for more, but never satisfied. What God is saying, what is true about these Babylonians is true about anyone who trusts in themselves. If you trust in yourself, you have no other God but yourself. You get to do what you think is right. You get to live your life that way. And you would think that would be, a, for some people, they think that's the way to live. That would be a way to a satisfying life, but you're never satisfied because you never feel content. There's always more that you need. There's always more that you want. But on the other hand, the one who trusts in God and lives by faith is going to have a life that is fulfilled and filled with contentment. Uh, this verse, Habakkuk 2, 4, is quoted three times in the New Testament. The righteous will live by faith. We live by faith when we put our faith in Jesus Christ and he saves us. But we also live by faith each and every day as we trust him and we follow him. When things don't make sense, as they didn't in Habakkuk's day, and may not in your personal life and may not in our national life at the moment, we can... Look at ourselves, or we can trust God and live by faith. Not by what we see, but faith in God. God goes on to say some more things about those who trust in themselves and those who trust in Him. There are five woes that come next in Habakkuk chapter 2. I don't have time to read them all to you this morning, 
but I did want to highlight them. Those who trust in themselves, God says, watch out. And here are the five. He says, woe to those who exploit others to gain wealth, for their riches will be stolen from them. Again, these are directly, specifically to the Babylonians, but it's true of anyone who trusts in themselves, who do these things, this is the destruction that will come on them. Those who steal from others think they will accumulate wealth. Well, God says, no, you're going to lose that one day. For the Babylonians... Their money, their wealth was taken from them when the next nation came and destroyed them. And everything they had accumulated, God took away from them. God says, woe to those who trust in wealth to bring security, for they will lose everything. Don't we see so many people doing that today? They think the more money they have, the more secure they will be. They can buy more insurance. They can buy better uh, gates. They can buy better security cameras. They can have more retirement. They can live life without worrying about stock market crashes or about thieves or about anything like that because they have gathered wealth to give themselves security. But in the end, what happens if your trust is in your wealth? You lose it all. You will eventually lose all your wealth, lose all your security, and lose everything. So it's foolish to trust in that. God says, woe to those who oppress others to build themselves up, for they'll be brought down and forgotten. This is the classic case of the bully. You know, the bully likes to push others around and put others down so that he can lift himself up. Bullies at times think that they are popular because everyone's afraid of them. They think they have position because everyone's afraid of them. They think they're somebody because they can push other people around. But in the end, they're going to be pushed down by a bigger bully. <laughs> and then no one's going to remember them at all. Isn't that true of all of the dictators of the world and world history? I think every... A political dictator, bully, at the time that he was at the height of his power, thought the world's going to always remember me and I'm going to be powerful forever. God just laughs at that because that's not what happens. In time, they're brought down. They're forgotten. They trusted in themselves and they have lost everything. God also warns those who deceive others to do violence to them. Or you could even broaden it. Those who are deceptive to get what they want from other people. Don't you know people like that? They'll, they'll lie or they'll tell a half-truth or they'll deceive others just so they can get what they want. They're only focused on themselves and they want to get something from someone else. And they, they're deceptive to get that. But God knows that. And God will bring His wrath. And finally, the fifth woe is for, to those who worship other gods, those idols will fail them, and one day they'll have to see the real God face to face. The Babylonians were idolaters, they worshiped false gods, but God was going to bring them down. And then they were going to have to face the real God, not the false ones they worshiped. There in Habakkuk 2, it talks about the foolishness of people who build an idol and they worship it. Jeremiah does the same thing. And if you think about it, it's very humorous to think that, you know, in ancient times, people would build an idol out of stone or build it out of wood, build it out of gold. They would build it and then they would pray to it. Now, think about it for a minute. I mean, didn't you just build the thing? So now, now who really is, is the bigger one? If I built it, I guess I'm bigger than it, but I'm praying to it and expecting this this piece of wood to do something for me or do something for my life? When you think about it, it's, it's ridiculous and it's silly. And that's what Habakkuk says and Jeremiah and other parts, places in the prop. Why would you worship something that you have created? Worship the creator himself. All those who trust in themselves really are a god unto themselves and they worship themselves and do everything for themselves. But one day, 
their life is going to be over and they're going to stand before the one true God. And then everything they've created for themselves and did for themselves is going to come to nothing. And all those gods they made for themselves will vanish away. The presence of the one true God. And then there's going to be a reckoning. Woe to those who don't realize that and aren't prepared for that. So those who trust in themselves have these warnings to look out for what you do. But I want to close with this, these blessed assurances to those who put their faith in God. Here in the back, God says four things to those who trust him rather than themselves. First is God's plan is always accomplished at the perfect time. Always. Listen to what God says here. The Lord answered me, write down this vision, clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end and will not lie. Now listen to this. Though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and not be late. That's true of God's prophecies. That's true of his work in your life. We have to be patient. We have to wait. But God always works at the perfect time. He's never too soon. He's never too late. It's always the perfect time. It may not seem that way to us. It may seem like a long wait. It may seem like it comes too soon. But no, it's always the perfect time. So that should give us comfort when we trust in God and we're waiting for, uh, waiting for something, waiting for an answer to prayer, waiting for God to act. We may have to wait, but it's not because God is indecisive. It's not because God's not listening. It's not because God doesn't know what he's going to do. It's because God has a perfect plan that he will fulfill in his perfect time. So be patient. Trust in him. God also says this, the righteous will live by faith. We've looked at that verse. Don't be discouraged by what you are seeing because we don't live by what we see. We live by faith. What God has promised us, what God has told us he's going to do, we live by that. We follow him. We don't look at what's around us and follow that and see that and get discouraged and give up. We live by faith. God's glory is going to fill this earth one day. And for those of us who trust in him, we can bring glory to him today and we will experience that moment in time in the future when God's glory will be over all the earth. Listen to what he says here. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the water covers the sea. Now, isn't that an amazing thing to look forward to? The sea covers the the whole earth, and the knowledge, the glory of God will as well. Finally, God is on his throne and has everything under control. So sometimes we just need, honestly, we just need to shut up, just let him do what he's going to do. Uh, Listen to Habakkuk 2.20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the whole earth be silent in his presence. That's like the mic drop. You know, the guy just says, you know, God has been patient with Habakkuk. He's been listening. He's been answering. This is the last verse before chapter 3 where Habakkuk sings a song, which we'll look at next week. But now all the back and forth, the questions, the explanation, Habakkuk wants to know this. Tell me this, God. This doesn't make sense, God. God says, be silent. I'm in control. I'm on my throne. I'm done. God's done talking to him. He just says, Habakkuk, I'm in control. Trust me. Be silent and just watch me work. Now, sometimes that's just what we've got to do. It's okay to question. It's okay to, to want to understand. But at some point... A trust in God is simply just shutting up, putting our faith in him, and letting him do his work. 
Psalm 46.10 says this. God says, Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. God, we come to you this morning and acknowledge that you are God, that you are in control, that you have a perfect plan at a perfect time, And that you work out everything for our good and your glory for those who believe in you, who love you, and trust you. So Lord, my prayer this morning is for us to examine our lives. Because Lord, we may be complaining to you about a life that's filled with pain and turmoil and suffering. And we've brought it on ourselves Because we've run away from you. We filled our life with sin. If that's the case this morning, Lord, I pray that we would repent of it and we would be right with you right now. Yet, Lord, I know often the suffering of this world is not because we're being punished for our sin. It's for other reasons. Many times reasons unknown, never known, never explained. And Lord, if that's where we are this morning, my prayer is that we would trust you. Trust you. Your timing is perfect. It's by faith that we can see you are doing great and mighty things. You are on your throne. Your glory will one day fill this earth. Lord, I pray for us to be silent and to trust. And I pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Stand with me, please, as we close. This is your time to respond. If you are not right with God, repent. Get right with Him now. If you are just beside yourself because everything is out of control, trust the Lord today. I will be at the back to pray with you about anything. If you want to make any commitment to the Lord, sure, or you need prayer this morning, I will be there as we sing, as we close, as we respond. Let's get right with the Lord before we leave this building this morning. Mary, would you lead us? Father, we come before your throne this morning. Lord, we humble ourselves, Lord. We're not in control. You are in control. We bow to your authority, Lord. We bow to um, everything that you've done for us and everything that you've given us, Lord. We thank you for our many blessings. Lord, I thank you um, 
for this church. I thank you for the people of this church. I thank you that they have humble hearts, Lord. I thank you that they have hearts um, that love you, hearts that want to serve you, Lord. I thank you for this congregation. I've never met a congregation that has hearts as humble as these hearts in this church, Lord. Lord, I just thank you for them. I thank you for what you're doing in this church. I thank you that... um, that you are making us into the disciples that you want us to be, Lord. I ask you to bless these sweet people today. Lord, I ask you to meet them at every need that they may have. Lord, I just thank you for everything that you've done um, for this church. Lord, as I look out and look out to the other people um, in the United States of America, Lord, I look to people that call you their own, Lord. The majority of people say that they're Christians and, and Lord... Um, You tell us in your word that if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves to seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then you will hear from heaven, Lord, you will forgive their sins, Lord, and you will heal their land. A lot of people want your blessings without repentance, Lord, and we repent. We come to you, Lord. We tell you today that we are not um, what we need to be. Um, We ask you for forgiveness for um, our country and our lives individually, Lord, and our homes. We ask you for forgiveness um, for abortion, um, for things, Lord, that are not in your word, things that you have not ordained that are being done today. Lord, I ask you for Christians to stand up and to realize um, your ways, what your word says, and be a light in this world to other people. In Jesus' name, amen.